Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Finance, Operations, and Personnel Committee meeting on Monday, June 12th, 2023. It is 4.32, and we are getting started right now. Um, I'm Sarah Bryden. I'm the chair of the committee. We have um, committee members, um, board member Opperman and board member Figdor with us, um, and some um, illustrative members of the staff with us, which we will get to in a little bit. Um, just for a quick high level overview of what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to uh, do public comment. If there's anybody that would like to get public comment, um, we're going to talk about a very um, important thing to keep in mind for tomorrow. Um, we are going to have an update about um, our ADP work, and we're going to talk about longer term budget planning and um, non-committee member, but board chair Lentz has joined us as well. Um, just wanted to call that out. And um, incoming superintendent, um, Dr. Ryan Scallon has joined us. Gang's all here, enough at least to get started. Um, okay, so first things first, I want to see if anybody um, would like to give public comment. Can I go over to attendee? There are no attendees. All right, so I will close public comment. <clears throat> And then, so before I hand it over to um, co-interim superintendent Townsend um, to talk about um, uh, ADP, uh, I wanted to make sure to remind anybody that might be watching this um, later today after you put your kids to bed or what have you, um, that tomorrow, June 13th, is election day. Um, so I would encourage everybody to get out and vote um, on the school budget and uh, have your say. Uh, the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. tomorrow, Tuesday, June 13th. And with that, our introductions are complete. Aaron, take it away. Very good. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, uh, Emily, before we go on, you got hand raised? I just wanted to welcome incoming Superintendent Scallon. So good to see you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. Um, yes, we're excited to have you start to loop in of uh, the topics du jour. So appreciate you being able to join tonight. Um, good, uh, good uh, perspective. Um, yeah, for your perspective, Ryan, I don't, well, you may have seen trafficking on email. We had uh, Phil. So if you didn't get to meet Phil when you were in town, Phil Doughty is our director of IT. Um, and he and his team were wrangling some uh, technology issues over the weekend and into this morning. So uh, we thought it might make sense to just hear a quick update about what happened um, and kind of what the issues were and kind of what the prognosis is around network reliability kind of moving forward. So um, so we'll open with kind of this agenda item real quick or non-agenda item, but just kind of informational bit um, before we jump into the two agenda items for today. So um, welcome, Phil. Um, if you want to give us just a quick kind of summary of what transpired over the weekend into, into this morning and kind of where things stand. Absolutely. Uh, nice to meet you, Ryan. I didn't get to meet you in person, but and nice to see everybody else. Uh, so this weekend, uh, we received notification from Network Maine, who is our internet service provider. They're based out of UMaine Orono. They supply us with what's called MSLN, the Maine School Library Network, provides internet to most districts in the state. Um, they alerted us that their equipment that they provided us, it's called the Edge Router, um, was unresponsive. So Sunday morning, um, our data center engineer, Josh, went in to investigate and troubleshoot and uh, there was an issue with the router itself. Uh, so uh, after multiple escalations with Network Maine's NOC um, and University of Maine in Orono, um, we replaced, they drove down and we replaced the appliance around 8.30, quarter nine last night. Um, when I left the data center last night, all systems were up functioning, no issues, phones working, wireless VPN, <clears throat> excuse me, everything else. Uh, however, over the, uh, over the course of the night, one of the UPSs, which is our battery backup systems that we use to plug all equipment in in case there's a power blip, um, uh, failed in rack two. And what that is, is there are these two load balancing devices for power. And when one fails, it shifts the load completely to the other. And that's too much of a load for one to, to handle. So all of our servers, including Infinite Campus, our Cisco call manager and voice gateway, which manages the outgoing interface for all of our phones, and our uh, VMware virtual environment all were power cycling on and off, on and off, on and off. Um, so this morning, 
around seven, I got to the data center um, and we had to replace the other UPS. Um, and then we had to bring the system back up one server at a time, starting with critical infrastructure. Um, by 11 a.m., we were fully operational again. Great. Um, thank you, Phil, for and Josh and the team for, you know, um, a full day's work yesterday and then kind of critical work starting this morning. Um, so, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Thanks so much. And then I'll go to Emily. Um, uh, I see your hand. I'll go to you right after. Um, so I'm curious about whether um, this is the same or similar or completely different from what caused the outage several months ago. Um, I remember there was talk about, you know, um, there should have basically like there should have been two things and there wasn't a backup where we needed a backup or something like that a few months ago. Um, uh, is this the same thing? Is that uh, the one in like late fall around the payroll issues? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's different. So that was it okay. with our core network, um, uh, which is a joint uh, operation between us and the city of Portland. Okay. Um, this is not, this is while it's at a core location, yeah, uh, past, it wasn't the core itself. It was, it was something. Okay. Else. So yeah. it's not like that went unresolved and, you know, we didn't fix it and it happened again. It's, we just had bad luck in a completely new way. And, yeah. 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 Luck. <laughs> um, and, uh, a quick update on the core environment. We've received mm. the new cores um, and they've been installed. Uh, we're just waiting for school to be out. We're doing our cutovers for the school system in July, starting uh, one per week um, because it needs to bring down a segment of that network each time. So um, so that is moving forward. So, Super, thank you. Board member Figdor, go ahead. Thank you so much. And Phil, thank you for all your work in the last 48 hours in particular. Um, my question was similar to the chairs um, with respect to what I understood to be kind of a circuit breaker issue in the fall. Um, but maybe that's not the right language. Um, but I'm just wondering in the case um, of what we experienced uh, last night and this morning, is there an, any additional backup that we could put into place to avoid um, you know, to avoid the network going down like it did mm -hmm. this morning. Um, yes. And I'm and sorry that I don't, I, I get all the lingo wrong. I'm really sorry. Totally understand. I know what you mean. Um, so we, there's a couple of things we can do. We can create what's called a, a disaster recovery hot site, uh, which we sort of kind of have a little bit at Deering, but it's not fully built out. What that is, is it's a duplicate of our data center at Deering that, or another location that if something were to happen at our data center at PAS, that we could fire that up and, you know, critical infrastructure continue to function. Um, unfortunately, that's a significant cost and um, uh, planning uh, to to get done. And in the past, it was, we've, you know, attempted to do it, but it was always kind of, a, it's not a priority. Um, also, moving more of our data center infrastructure to the cloud could help prevent what happened today, um, but not what happened yesterday. Um, because that would just put more emphasis on our internet connections and we would still need a DR site for internet somewhere in the district as well. Um, so it's, uh, that's, those are the two big things that we could do, um, apart from staffing 24 seven on site, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. Board member Opperman, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Um, what's the ballpark, Phil, on that cost? Are we talking 100000 500000 I would, I would close to a million at least, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And that's, you're talking about the kind of backup data center at Deering or some other location versus the cloud solution. Yeah. The cloud solutions we have evaluated, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, we evaluated Microsoft Azure, Google's Google Cloud Platform, and Azure, uh, I'm sorry, um, Amazon's AWS, but it was deemed more expensive than still staying on-prem, so we we upgraded on-prem at the time. So, like, I mean, significant cost difference, so. Right. Information, M much of it's over my head, but I really appreciate it. Um, Terry Lentz, go ahead. Yeah, no question, but just really want to thank you, Phil. I'm sure it was not a great uh, space to be in over the weekend and that you got us back online by 11 is incredible. Um, so just thank you to you and your team. I know you're often people who are invisible in our district. So uh, just really appreciate everything you did to make it happen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
And it was, I think I've shared with you, Chair Lance, but just for full visibility, kind of the network mains initial response was like, oh, we think we can get a part there the 11 a.m. Monday morning. And so through Phil's advocacy and work with them as a vendor, you know, kind of communicating the appropriate level of urgency, um, uh, you know, managed to, and even offering to drive up and get it and so forth. So certainly above and beyond to ensure we were as set up as we could be um, for today. And then to have something else unrelated fall off um, was just kind of a little bit the year it's been um, and uh, appreciate now the reliability we have going forward with um, kind of the new infrastructure there in places. So, so thank you, Phil. Extend the thanks to Josh and Jay. So that's kind of the network team, um, the primary members of our network team in terms of the IT. So a little bit, Ryan, as you get to the feel, we kind of have the network team and um, well, forgive me, uh, you know, Greg and our team of techs that provide the Go ahead. Why don't you explain just briefly? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, we have our our engineering team, which are and which encompasses our network uh, infrastructure individuals. Uh, but then we also have our technician team that manages help desk tickets and student one to one in the schools. Yeah. So, and that's where we added an additional FTE for this year on the technician team um, to be able to support you know the increased number of devices and kids and staff hands since the pandemic. So super, and you're all doing such important work. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any other right. questions before we move on? Super. Great. All right. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for jumping in. Take care, everybody. Great. Um, so uh, I also should say, just to make sure people were aware who weren't on the email, um, Malia is uh, attending the final meeting of the like foundations. Um, board meeting this evening. So she's there. This is the advantages of the co, you know, we can be in multiple places at once. Um, so she's at that meeting. So just for transparency of um, Malia's whereabouts, but uh, excited to jump into the ADP update. So uh, welcome, Brianna Tendall. So Brianna, if you're hearing us, welcome. Um, so I'll introduce you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, but I'll introduce Brianna again in a sec. So um, we're going to just kind of step through, you know, a relatively yeah. relative on the kind of project implementation status of uh, the ADP implementation um, and talk about kind of what we've accomplished to date, kind of where the project stands and kind of forecasting ahead in terms of where, um, you know, oh, where things are kind of um, headed in terms of the trajectory of the implementation. And then we'll open it up. Oh, okay. So, um, so the goal is just a bit of a project status update for today to have people kind of know where we where we are in this work. Let me bring up our slide deck here. Um, so again. Um, I'll do a little bit of introductions and then I'll turn it over to Brianna to do kind of a project overview and talk about next steps. And then we'll uh, open it up for, you know, kind of questions as it relates to kind of ADP. Um, so again, just a reminder um, to kind of set ourselves up. We made the decision to kind of jump into the ADP work. Uh, it was clear both because of the you know uh, challenges we were managing in payroll at the time, but probably outside of that, um, the recommendation of you know having an experienced kind of project manager to help support us as we move through uh, implementation. So Brianna, um, so we identified we got recommendations from a number of folks, um, talked to other districts that had gone through ADP implementations. Um, and landed on Coa Hills Consulting as a team that had experience primarily, and we were looking for um, experience in the Munis environment so that it could really reflect kind of our needs and where we are, um, as, uh, but also had experience in some of these kinds of implement system implementations. So um, we ultimately selected Coa Hills, and so Pro Brianna is the project manager from Coa Hills. So really, Rihanna's role um, is kind of keeping a bird's eye view and really represents us with ADP. So on the ADP side, there's kind of a lead project manager on their side. And um, yeah. Rihanna, Rihanna, individual, Marsha, um, you know, collaborate frequently. And those are some of the work. So ADP, obviously, is an enormous global organization. Right. Um, right. Rihanna's work a lot has helped to focus on 
kind of managing up, I might describe it as, with ADP in terms of ensuring that we're well represented in the context of kind of this implementation um, and that it's a kind of true collaboration. And so also then, obviously, internally in partnership with Terry, um, keeping us on track with the kind of timelines and deliverables, um, you know, in terms of kind of our in- execution internally. So, um, so that's been Brianna in her role. Um, you know, Terry, whose eldest is graduating from college, um, so graduated over the weekend. Um, so exciting for him. But uh, thus, he's not here. But Terry, you know, has been kind of the lead for us on our end in terms of the implementation. Barbara Owens DeWitt, our controller, um, you know, kind of representing from the finance side. Certainly, Miranda before her transition. Um, Chris St. Louis from the director of HR. Uh, because it has a lot of HR implementation elements. Um, and then Barb Stoddard, um, who you know has, con- has continued with us, um, has continued to be kind of a key resource. And then lastly, Lorraine um, Ghostlaw, who has been with us kind of since the fall, um, you know, in a kind of temporary role through the um, staffing agency that um, she helped get us through the intensity of the payroll challenges um, and has you know, a lot of data experience. So we've really been able to leverage a lot of her capacity um, over the past couple months to this project to help ensure, um, you know, with her kind of background and now familiarity with our systems um, to help do a bunch of the data work to ensure, um, you know, that uh, we're able to roll over a lot of the data to, um, you know, to make sure it's a smooth transition. So she's continued to be a huge key resource. And we're not, um, you know, one of the ongoing challenges for us is, you know, both continuing to execute payroll as, you know, in all of our finance functions as successfully and efficiently and accurately as possible in the current environment. Um, And, you know, we continue to make progress of digging out of you know, any remaining payroll things, and then this implementation. So, um, you know, so we're trying to balance just those demands, um, you know, kind of online staff and seeking to kind of have additional capacity wherever we can. Um, So that's a little bit of kind of what the primary project team has been. Um, So, Brianna, I think I'll turn it over to you for this next um, set of slides to kind of talk us through. Um, Yeah. I'll uh, have you continue driving. Um, I wanted to do a quick audio check. I think there was some previous feedback. How does it sound now? You guys can hear me okay? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Aaron. Um, Again, my name is Brianna Tyndall, and I am uh, facilitating the project efforts as a partnership with um, ADP and the Portland Public Schools team. Um, I do work for COA Hills, and some of you may or may not have met some Tom or, or Mike. Um, they weren't able to make it today, but um, I started working with Portland back in uh, February, and I've gotten to know the team quite well. And um, we've had, um, you know, a lot of things going on with the project, and I'm very, very happy and very um, excited to to see where the project continues to progress. Um, between now and what June four or five months we've we've made a ton of progress and delivered a lot of um, activities and and items to ADP. So I've been very happy to to meet and get to know this team. Um, we've got a solid team and everybody is being very supportive and and promoting the efforts of the project and and um, so we've got a, a really good project going on. Um, so I wanted to talk about the overview. And, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to interject. Um, we do have a Q&A session at the end as well. Um, but without going into the detail specifics of this, um, you know, we have a high level four phases, if you will. And so the first couple of months, we've spent quite a bit of time on um, gathering your policies and procedures, getting documentations. We've met quite a bit with ADP in, in translating those requirements to them so that they can take that and configure the system. Um, we've also been doing analysis um, of the, the data in the current MUNIS system. We've done a lot of work with um, making sure that the data that we are pulling out of MUNIS and getting to ADP is of quality and accuracy. Um, in fact, we've spent quite a bit of time in doing that, um, and that has actually resulted in an agreement and decision to um, add a few additional weeks to the overall go-live timeline. 
um, with ADP. Uh, we felt it was more important and critical to make sure that we spent the time up front and making sure that the data coming out of the system was was good or needed to be fixed or addressed um, before it went to ADP. Um, so through that work efforts, um, we've agreed and, and collaborated with ADP on coming up with a new time frame, um, which is in uh, October. Um, and Brianna, we've, just we've, highlight for make the connection for folks. Um, our team really identified when we got to that moment as uh, the place where things were. I guess I hear my audio. Maybe it's me that has the audio issues, but um, uh, the where things went off the rails a little bit on the Munis implementation. Um, that there was, um, you know, was specifically kind of in the data conversion work. And so we were, um, you know, folks who had been through that on our side, um, kind of recognized that moment. And as you know, I mean, there's lots of pressure to move forward towards the implementation dates, right? Um, and so it was, um, you know, a call to make to say, you know, we need to ensure quality ultimately, right? Um, in terms of the setup and configuration, those were kind of the critical moments so that in the design and build phases, everything was kind of progressing on top of quality data. So just to kind of highlight and make that connection to, you know, what some of the challenges were that we've then kind of been living with somewhat in the Munis environment um, that, you know, that was kind of, you know, that was the connection there. Yep, and um, the the other part that uh, was a result of the 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 last couple of months, as we were doing analysis and um, working with ADP on helping them to configure their system, um, we've been meeting with them weekly between payroll and and human resources topics and configuration. Is that um, Portland has um, identified a need to add some additional modules to the overall product solution with ADP? Um, the name of those two modules is um, uh, Workforce Now Benefits, so basically Benefits Module, and also the Health Compliance Module. Um, you know, they will have a really a tremendous value to add to the overall product of suites. Um, the benefits piece, you know, tracks and automates the, the benefits enrollments, um, flexible rate structures, It'll track dependents and beneficiary information, COBRA activities, um, the health compliance module that is a combined with that will be um, assisting with the state compliance reporting. So think ACA, health coverage reporting, um, any penalty management as needed. So between those two, um, with Portland's, we've agreed that it would be a great value. And, you know, for those folks that are overseeing enrollments and benefits pieces, it'll help them to be able to free up their time to commit to other, you know, efforts and, and priorities internally. Um, and so between adding those two modules in conjunction with making sure we focused on the quality of the data, it was decided that uh, we wanted to push back um, on going live with uh, ADP. Would that be accurate, Erin? <laughs> yeah, and I think I briefed a little bit in a weekend update at one point, you know, about the modules. Um, you know, I mean, it was, it became clear that, um, you know, the benefits piece a little bit different than we understood it during the initial sales, um, you know, kind of engagements, um, you know, was going to require a significant level of manual entries. Um, and as we know, you know, deductions and correct deductions and all those issues were one of the, you know, one of the elements of challenge, right, that we experienced. And so this is going to automate a significant amount of that and allow employees a lot of direct access to make changes, right, and kind of manage their own benefits. And so, um, you know, I think it has a huge value add for us. And obviously, the ACA reporting, um, having that be automated, drawn down straight from the system, um, again, a huge efficiency. And from a compliance perspective, um, you know, certainly hits the mark with some of the kind of prior challenges we'd had around that. Um, Board Member Opperman, go ahead. Hi. Um, hello, Brianna. Uh, question is, who will be overseeing what happens in the ADP on these new modules? If, this, if the people who, uh, the individual uh, clients, the, the, work, the workforce, are doing their own thing and, and changing things, how is it monitored? 
um, meaning like how benefit changes or life changes are being monitored. So you would still have somebody with, with the Portland Public School Districts able to log into the ADP portal to be able to access and manage the, the benefit information. So you have, you know, you've got your benefits enrollment that will be managed by ADP using that module that the employees would log into a portal and be able to elect their, their choices through open enrollments. Um, and then also through various life event changes, you will still have some, some staff from PPS of Portland to be able to access the portal and manage and maintain the, that information as well. As a follow-up question, can I, um, this is a confirmation um, to ensure shared understanding. I'm assuming it's that um, an employee would be able to go into a portal and change things like their address, their filing status, married, single types, stuff that they have control over, and, but then they wouldn't have access to things like how much money they make or, you know, things like that, right? Uh, yes and no until right to the very end. Um, um, yes. So part of this analysis and configuration stage as ADP is working with us and trying to understand what it is Portland needs in terms of configuring the portal, right? So there's an administrative piece for the portal that dictates what the employee can do. Um, can they enter their direct deposit information? Can they update their status information? And if so, would there be a level of approval behind the scenes? And so, yes, all those can be uh, accommodated. They could see their earnings, their check stubs. Um, if if designed accordingly, they would be able to add their direct deposit banking information, um, change number of dependents or um, telephone number, address, certain demographic information. So some of those things, yes, would be locked down and not being able to uh, allow them to edit it. But again, that's all part of that configuration stage that we work with ADP on that. Okay, super. So it's a bunch of different types of information. And the decisions are being made right now around access and what's read only and what's editable and all that. You bet. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, board member Opperman, did you have another question or is that your, okay. Yep. Super. Okay. Onward. Continue. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So bringing us up to June, um, you know, we are, we have basically given uh, ADP, the information. So we've shared policies, procedures. We've talked about you know, how we want to calculate overtime, how employer pay contributions or pension plans are calculated. Um, so we've shared that information and they are actively, as of today, this week, they are still configuring and designing their system. Um, and also they are um, taking our data. So we've given them employee demographics. We've given them employee pay information, job position information, um, historical paycheck information. All of that data has been provided to them and they are working on um, converting that, getting that into the system. Um, so that's where we're at today. You know, for in the next couple of weeks, I've been sharing with the team, you know, we're going to be entering a new phase, this validation phase of, of you know, what, what's, what's coming next. Um, so that will bring us into our next slide, Erin. All right. So what is next? Um, we needed to establish a new timeline. So we have been working with the ADP project manager on understanding, okay, we've introduced two modules. We've taken some extra time on ensuring we provided uh, accurate data, employee information to you. And so we have come up with a new agreement on the time frame, which is now uh, October 1st or the, the first page of October, if you will. Um, so really the next steps, and, and as you could see in the last slide, is going into the next phase, which is the testing and validation. Um, so that's where we are going to be looking at all the information that we've provided that they've put into ADP. We'll be doing thorough testing and making sure that things like the pay rates are correct, that they are assigned to the correct jobs and positions. Um, the other side of that is validating by running a test payroll, making sure that payroll is calculating pays and, and et cetera um, in, in, a, in a test payroll. So that's really going to take up the next, I'd say, at least two months um, is really testing all that, making sure that what we've determined in our configuration is truly what we've expected as a result of our testing and making sure that if we need to make changes, we go and make those, those, those fine tuning um, within ADP. So as we are heading into, we'll say August, mid-August, um, you know, Aaron and I have been talking about what does the training look like. Um, we have training from 
your staff in terms of how to log into the portal as a manager and manage certain activities of the employees. Um, HR may need to log in and, and enter new hires. Um, you have employees that need to know how to log in to view their pay stubs or change their tax information. And you're also going to have employees that will be doing time entry, right? So we'll have a new time entry system that uh, may have a clock in, clock out, or a badge system or whatnot. So we have already been engaged in some of those conversations and what that will look like. And, um, and then as we go into uh, our go live, which will be October, we will have a month of planning for what the go live looks like, right? Is the employee population ready? Is, is the ADP system ready? Uh, we will have a very uh, close partnership with ADP as we start running and processing the, the, the payrolls, right? So we will work with them until the team at Portland is comfortable and confident that payroll is successful, it's running on time, and it's, it's calculating as needed. So that, that will be a roughly October um, timeframe. So if for those of you that like specific dates, let's go to the next slide and we'll just present a, a few high level dates out here. Um, primarily the, the dates of go live will be your first October paycheck, which will be your last two weeks of September, I believe. Um, and I know this doesn't have a lot of information. We can always provide some more thorough or detailed dates in here, but this was really the importance of this was to understand, you know, why we came up with this October date based on the, the few changes that were made to the scope of the project. Um, but we are engaging in making sure we have a training plan and strategy in place. Um, we're going to make sure that the payroll testing with ADP is running successfully. Um, and these are the key dates that we're going to, to work towards and strive to for our October go live. Well, let me just add two quick things before we kind of wrap on presentation wise. And, um, you know, just, uh, Sarah, I know you'll help manage time just so we can make sure because we got a, another media agenda item. But uh, two other considerations that inform the timeline issue, just to name as we got into the project. Um, one was the training one and ensuring that we had access to people to train them before they came back and in such a way that it was going to be um you know uh not feel overwhelming and set us up for success so thinking a lot about the school year folks in particular so that with the earlier time frame they were going to be coming back like the window to train them to use the system was going to be as they were starting the year and that felt like a potential tension point and a vulnerability for us of the tightness of those timelines so, um, you know, particularly for the hourly folks who it's going to be a whole new system for them to enter, right? You know, that's again, one of our challenges now is time, time is managed in one whole platform, right? And payrolls run in another here, one platform, talk to each other. Um, uh, so, so that was one, just the training like plan uh, allowed us, you know, um, some confidence there. And then as we were navigating that, it became clear that then this is the fourth quarter reporting. So this, so we'll be launching this in the first payroll run, 10 six and quarter four. So it just had a little cleanness to it as well in terms of our reporting and tax reporting things. So, um, so ultimately, in addition to, I mean, the two primary things were, you know, we wanted to make sure it was right, you know, good data going in to in initiate the configuration, you know, some adjustments with the additions of these, uh, you know, the two modules, but then those are just two other things that kind of emerged as we were in the midst of kind of this work that felt like why this 10.6 kind of go live date made sense. And, and Aaron, you're absolutely right. 10 cents, 10, the October, beginning of October, very much will make sense just based on a quarterly cadence and you've got some tax reporting uh, from payroll perspective that makes it much easier for them to generate reports based off a quarter rather than, um, you know, off, off quarter cycle or off cycle. So. Um, Brianna and Aaron, are you ready for questions? Are we? <laughs> 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 the fact that you have to ask, are we ready, makes me wonder. Is now a good time for questions, or did you have more content that you wanted to? Cover? I think just the, our last slide is just this training slide, so we, this can be very quick. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, the flow here is we have the immediate team members, 
you know, have been, there's a big long, you know, kind of training sequence um, in the ADP platform. So the team members are doing their training modules. The flow is then that then the staff within our teams, so the finance and the payroll uh, payroll um, and HR staff, right, you know, will do, do their training. And then uh, we're hoping to capture some training over the summer. So our priority over the summer before school starts is um, to first do administrators and year-round lead secretaries who will have admin functions in the system, particularly as it relates to time accounting and approvals. Um, so to ensure that they get, uh, have the opportunity to be trained um, and then, you know, to try and begin to capture any of our year round uh, hourly staff um, as well, since we, so we can kind of narrow down the numbers we need to train later and, um, you know, when people are back. So then as part of Summer Institute, so just making the connection to the, um, you know, the pushback by the day of the school start date, right? That's going to be a big time where we'll capture people's time um, to do some of this initial training for staff. So anyway, so that's kind of the rollout plan in terms of training. Super. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then as far as on, on my end, just, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have a good team to work with. You know, Aaron's been super helpful and supportive and the whole team is very, you know, responsive and, and, and willing to, to work together and, and be collaborative. And, and I know, you know, summer months, it's, it's, it's a big project to take on in the summer months. So, um, you know, we've got a great team and, and I look forward to continuing to work with them on this project. Super. Um, board member Opperman, go ahead. Thank you. Um, training is, is very, very important. And my concern is, I think your plan is great for those in present in the system um, and who are comfortable working with um, technology. Um, there's a variety of people um, with multiple language issues and also people being hired out through the year and to the end of the year. And I'm wondering... Who's going to be holding hands for all those people? Um, is there is it a particular person that will be in central office, um, or is there a team in central office? I know they have admin positions, but um, who's going to be the go-to person at that point? Yep. Um, yeah. Great. Great question, Julianne. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, part of the function of uh, the kind of investments in increasing the number of HR generalists is going to allow for the deeper onboarding. So the kind of like, how do you access your paycheck? How do you enter your time? Those kinds of things will become a part of kind of their onboarding experience. So we're not going to, you know, in the, you know, we'll review benefits information, but then they'll be able to elect those things. So there'll be, even in the onboarding check-in, they'll be have a chance to get oriented to the system because they'll have to execute some things, you know, not necessarily immediately in that moment, but they'll be able to be provided kind of insight into what that looks like. So that's, so that's one of the ways in an ongoing way. So if you're hired in December, right, as a custodian, right, um, you'll get oriented through your onboarding through that. Um, certainly lead secretaries and those folks will have a role. And then one last thing that we've talked about and you know need to um, continue to pull the string through, but is having some kiosk, like tablet-based kind of kiosks in some of the offices or some of the time-based entry for some of our staff that's um, you know not as familiar with technology. Super. Board member Opperman, did you have a follow-up? Yes, I did. Go ahead. Um, Go for it. My question is that we've, we're bringing on more G HR generalists, but we're also having HR generalists having less work because this is, or payroll people having less work to do. Um, I just, the question I have is on the, not to overwork anybody, but to have the efficiency within the system there that we aren't um, overhiring. It's, you know, just I'm just looking at the second half of our meeting for that reason. So just, yeah. that's just a concern. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, intentionally one of the things we'll monitor over this year, ensuring we weren't pulling out resources before we were clear that they weren't needed. Um, and um, but that'll be a point for us to monitor um, as we learn more, um, you know, over the course of the year. And again, just a reminder and a little bit of framing for you, Ryan, so not to try and um, do too much of that here, because we'll catch up on all that as we get rolling. But, um, you know, we're trying to claw back from payroll, like payroll became both a technical execution operation of like, 
you know, just a business function but, and an employee relations function through some of the cuts to our HR staff, you know, in 2018. So this is now trying to remove the employee engagement function from the payroll staff and keep them focused on their technical work around payroll implementation. So we'll need to monitor all that to your point, Julian, um, but just a reminder and Ryan, a little bit of context for some of those changes. Great. Uh, Terry Lentz, go ahead. Yeah, just have a couple of follow-ups, but also just like I am really thankful that you are spending time and slowing things down to get it really right um, all the way across the board. So I just really appreciate that responsiveness to what you're you're seeing. Um, and I know that that's coming with increased costs, but I think that those costs are necessary and um so, so important to make sure that all of our staff are supported with this. Um, another question around um, the training um, uh, pieces, and I'm sure that this is already on your radar, but just, I talked to last fall, just several custodians who just felt so out of the loop around uh, the current payroll systems and how to utilize them. Um, uh, so thinking about like, what are the written documents that will be available? Could we do tutorials that are videos that people could access? And then also just thinking, I know all of our staff speak English to some level, but if, if there are like with these hard technical skills, if there is a way to do some translations in our um, biggest languages spoken by staff. Um, and then I just had a question in terms of, so, you know, every year when staff move up in pay scale or, you know, move positions, what part of that has to be re-entered every year versus having already like an algorithm that just calculates when people are, are moving up? And then how is that like audited for accuracy? Aaron, do you want to take a stab or me? <laughs> Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just to confirm my understanding of the question is how does it look for the progression of the employees as they progress from one step to the next? Um, you know, that is a good question. I think that there is a level of automation, but the decision is that because it varies by the employees, um, that we want to give Portland the flexibility to be able to move them up, um, uh, based on, and because there's also some, what we've discovered, some uniqueness or some exceptions to the standard rules of, you know, you don't just necessarily go up to the next grade or step, but um, there's also some exceptions. So in order to accommodate those, um, we wanted to make sure that the system was designed in a way that the user, HR, or payroll, whomever that responsibility will fall on, um, would have the ability to do that. Um, as far as, you know, audits, um, we can definitely come up with some reporting tools. I don't know as far as ADP, if they have their own checks and balances for something like that, because it's really unique to the client, but we can certainly have a report that maybe we could publish to the team or um, something that shows that here's the history of what's happened in the last year of who's moved to what step, um, if that would be helpful. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that answers my question in terms of the checks and balances and also just thinking in terms of increased capacity needed. So if, you know, in, in August of every year that hours are going to go up because we are, are having to do the manual entry and the checking, like thinking about how do we absorb that in, into the workflow and then restrict again after that. Um, those are just things I'm, I'm thinking about. Okay. The, the biggest investment in time will be any time an implementation of a new contract because the basic configuration will need to be updated, right? You know, so it's kind of like a three-year cycle per contract. Most of the other stuff will be automated, you know, with opportunities to, you know, kind of um, override, right? And for unique circumstances, as Brianna was saying. Um, but yeah, it's those contract implementations that are the biggest challenge because everything kind of needs to get refreshed for the given bargaining unit. Um, I you. have a yeah, um, that was very helpful. And as you were, Brianna, as you were giving that answer, I thought of a, another question to add to my list. Um, I'm curious about the approach. Um, I loved seeing on the slide earlier the words testing and validation. Yay! Um, I'm curious about um, whether you, whether the team, for example, might be, and if you're not, maybe you could, um, taking some of the situations that have gone sideways for us within the last several months and using those as, as acceptance criteria and making sure that like, if this were to happen 
in November, we'd be fine. Like, is that part of the team's approach? Absolutely. That will be part of the discussions of, you know, as we enter that phase is, okay, what are the unique situations, you know, and, and we've, we've had these conversations of what, uh, what, what kind of hiccups have occurred and, and uh, issues with the payroll that have gone on over the last course, you know, couple of months, but we would definitely want to include those, you know, there's things like garnishments or, you know, um, pay blending, um, blended rates, you know, those very unique situations. Um, we absolutely want to include what I like to tell my team when I do consulting or, or project management is to just pick the most difficult situations, <laughs> right? Because those are your problem child. And uh, we yeah. want to make sure that those are fleshed out, you know, because yeah. if we can handle those, yeah. even if it takes five tries, that's more practice on handling that and coming up with a solution that you could apply across the board to all the other smaller issues. But yes, you're, you're, it's a great idea and I'm glad you brought it up because it is important to have a list of scenarios of what it is that we want to test. I mean, yeah, we can test every employee, but at the end of the day, we really want to see what the outcome of a payroll situation is that you have already been experiencing in the past because that would, that would also highlight and sell and instill the confidence in the employees that ADP is, is a confident and, and solid product that's running the payroll and, you know, getting me my check. <laughs> um, to, so to specifically follow up on that, I'm curious about whether, and if you don't have this level of detail, that's totally fine. But um, uh, so is, so for the user experience, so for somebody who, for example, is an ed tech in the Portland Public Schools and they do a day of substitute teaching, it, like that's something that we had a tough time with. I'm curious about whether that's going to be a relatively painless, intuitive experience for them to go in and say, on this day, I was a sub. So you're you're referring to more of like the timekeeping component yeah. of it and yep. how they log time accordingly. Yep. Um, so yeah, that is part of the the timekeeping piece, and we haven't really gotten into that level of detail. But I have heard that situation <laughs> come up in some meetings. So um, yeah, I will I will make note of that because as we get into training on the timekeeping piece and what that's going to look like for the employees, it will be helpful to have those um, scenarios. And, and, you know, if you want to send those to Aaron, you know, maybe the team that we're working with may not have all those types of situations uh, privy to them. So we would, you know, want to capture those as well as we start testing the actual time clock or the timekeeping piece. Yep. Super. Thank you. Um, uh, out of curiosity, I'm wondering whether there are other modules that ADP offers that we're not taking advantage of right now and that we're not going to right now, but might be useful down the road in the future. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Um, uh, it's really the recruitment module is kind of probably the next one because that's the only, uh, that's the primary tool will um, remaining for our use of frontline um, is, so that's kind of like, you know, and that would just then integrate, you know, initial employee data into the system. So um, that's, that is the primary one I would flag. Um, you know, uh, I'll use this as just a moment to say when the, you know, we did get a little like side-eyed with ADP when they were like, oh, wait, the benefits module, we felt like we, you know, we felt like there was a little bit of a issue in their communication up front um, to just make sure that there was no other, well, add on, you know, now you got this and that Go means conversation. You you know, um, and uh, so they were clear that like this level of service, you know, is kind of like a self-contained unit, if you will, right, um, in terms of kind of the implementation of the, you know, the kind of workforce now, the position control benefits, time and accounting and all those functions. But I think recruitment would be the next one we find frontline to be pretty challenging. And so I think that's the next one we would evaluate in terms of utilizing ADP for, and that would offer some efficiencies in terms of data management. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions about training, popular topic. Um, I'm curious about whether ADP offers training materials. I'm guessing they probably don't offer anything like that completely off the shelf because every client's different, but I'm curious about what we might be able to leverage. What, so like, cause we don't have a technical writer, you know, um, unless we do that I don't know about. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about how the training materials will come to be. So that is a good question. I don't think I have a solid answer for that other than the the ADP portal um, has a, a 
a library of a ton of training sessions. So I do know that there's training for the core project team, right? To access payroll information, make changes at, at the, at the ADP product level. Um, there are training sessions for managers or supervisors. Um, so, you know, at the employee level, I'm not exactly sure what there is. So I will definitely check with ADP and see. Um, but I imagine that Based on what I've seen, they're very intuitive and they're very straightforward. You just click through them. So um, I'll double check with them. But I think that there's going to be some basic ones on how to access your pay stub, how to you know update your tax information and, and whatnot. Would there be anything outside of that? Um, and and let me add to that as far as the timekeeping system. I think that's actually a bigger component is you know entering time. Um, so it sounds like it would be ideal to have a very thorough documentation or some user guide that really allows the employee to walk through the steps on making sure they're logging their time accordingly. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so whether or not ADP generates or provides that, I, I don't know, but we'll definitely add that to you know the requirements in terms of how we're executing or coming up with our plan for, for training, our strategy for training. We'll make sure that we have that incorporated. Super. Appreciate it. Um, and then, so my other question around training is just confirming that, um, and like others have said, I respect and appreciate the decision to move to the October um, uh, go live date for the reasons we've all talked about. Um, I want to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. Um, so let's say somebody is brand new in the district starting in August, they're going to get two sets of training. Right. So they're going to, here's what you do for the first few weeks. And then here's what you're going to do in a few weeks after that. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, I'm sure that was a balancing act and I don't disagree with where you landed. Um, and then my last question is, um, do we have identified or, or rather, um, can we make sure that we have identified um, a contact or a system or what do we do? How do we get in touch with ADP if something goes sideways after you have moved on, Brianna? Um, I want to make sure that we account for that. I will provide you with ADP's point of contact. I will give you their address. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, what? So when when the implementation, the project is done and finished, how do you contact ADP? Um, I We really need to come up with a a a document, a process and procedure document for Portland that says, here's the um, gate, gatekeeper, for lack of better words, to ADP, right? Because ADP is, um, you know, they run the payroll. And so there still needs to be a close relationship between the payroll department at Portland Public Schools and the ADP payroll um, to make sure that they're capturing any changes and configurations and, and issues and whatnot. So, um, you know, having a gatekeeper for payroll and even HR items um, that has a, a independence or a very specific uh, relationship with ADP would be ideal. And then I, I also, I think, you know, Aaron and I have kind of talked about this in terms of a lot of these payroll related questions, right? I think the culture within Portland can, could, could benefit from having a very, um, specific plan for, okay, if you have an HR related question, this is, you know, go to your department head or go to your supervisor, or if it's a payroll related question, you know, here's a shared email or here's your point of contact. But that way there's a separation of duties that don't get um, blended or, or confused between the two that can, that can then also keep in line with that partnership with, with ADP. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. Yes, I agree. I think I was, I was thinking about two different buckets of topics. So I was thinking about, you know, the employee who thinks that their, you know, paycheck isn't correct and where do they go? But then also the, you know, the person in central office who uses um, the other side of the portal every day and is like, I click eight times to do one thing. How do I change this? Or like, how do we improve this? How do we, you know, that sort of, I'm curious about whether, you know, ADP uses like an account manager model or something okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they, yeah, they will have like an account or an engagement manager for uh, post post live needs. Um, so I can get some more information on that because I don't know exactly what their model is. I came from Munis World, and that's, that's I know that they have you know the the engagement managers, um, and they have a program that if you need future ongoing training, 
uh, to continue growing as a software that they have a program like that. So I can get more information from ADP and making sure that, hey, what, is it, what does it look like after we go live? You're not just leaving us and here's an email that nobody ever answers, right? Like, what is that, what does that level of communication and commitment look like um, for somebody who has questions like, this button's not working or I'm tired of running it 10 times every payroll. How do we fix it? How do we fix a process and procedure? Yeah. So Thank you. Question. I appreciate yeah. that very much. Um, just, just to say, and I think timing wise, I'd yep. like you know, to kind of maybe wrap this agenda item so we can get to the other um, piece. Um, I am uh, done with my questions. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Just the final step there kind of like in production, you know, kind of is that like high level Gantt chart, you know, about the project is transitioned to service. So it's like we're in implementation relationship and then we move into service relationship. So that'll get defined as we move through that part of it. But Thank you so much, Brianna. Yeah. Thank you, Brianna. Um, is it okay if I hop off? Good. Unless okay. It was about. very nice meeting everybody. Please let me know if you have any questions and I look forward to the next meeting. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Brianna. All right. Um, so F1 multi-year planning um, is kind of our next agenda item. So our, you know, our thought of the goals for the this discussion today was to talk a little bit about maybe to develop ideally some recommendations about how we would be organized to kind of carry out this work um, over the, you know, uh, both how we would get organized and what kind of timelines we would want to um, potentially have for ourselves uh, over the next, you know, six plus months here is what I would you know, tentatively say, but that's for discussion here. Um, so that's one outcome of this conversation is like, how do we want to be organized? We know there's some history. So Emily, you know, may ask you to kind of talk a little bit at some point about just kind of in the prior pass it's in some of this analysis, how that was organized. So I'll invite you to do that in a few minutes. Um, and then, you know, as we look at, you know, kind of the scope of things that have been surfaced historically in terms of um, both want to continue to keep in mind strategies on both cost savings as well as revenue enhancements, right? Um, so, you know, I think our prior efforts focused, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was a group focused specifically around cost savings. So I think as we approach this, you know, we have some opportunities to think about both sides of the equation. Um, but are there other ideas so that we can, as Ryan comes on board, we can map out with our team kind of like the work plan? Because a lot of these um, you know, issues require fairly significant analysis. You know, we have some basis for some of this that will need to be updated because it's now outdated in some respects for some of these things. Um, but my goal, you know, out of this and again, to just flag, we intend to have a full board workshop. So that would be the last one, you know, last little agenda item. Again, if we don't have time to get to that, that's fine. We can kind of collaborate offline about how to structure the dialogue to bring the full board and, you know, bring kind of that full visibility to this conversation um, at the board meeting next week. But um, my goal would be to kind of leave that with like, obviously things may change. We may come up with new ideas, new opportunities may present themselves. But we have a pretty good roadmap of kind of like the work plan we need to put together, um, you know, over the summer here so that we can engage meaningfully in these things, both internally and obviously with the public um, as we move through the fall. So so that goes to just are there other ideas that aren't reflected in kind of these cost savings ideas or other revenue things that we'd want to put on the table as potential items for us to um, put into the work plan for consideration and review. So we're not going to go deep on, you know what's the status of elementary reconfiguration, what schools are being partnered and how much is that going to save that kind of thing. That's not the intent of this conversation or really the board workshop conversation, right? But just that these are ones that have been identified as potential strategies, right? Um, so that then we can kind of update those numbers and get clear and come back. Board member Fictor, go ahead. This might be um, out of order, but I'm wondering if we can start the conversation, not today, but start the, the broader conversation with principles um, that we agree to to guide um, the process and decision making. So before we get um, we get you know focused on the details, we have something to hold us accountable to what we're trying to um, to achieve because we're trying to keep our work on track um, mm -hmm. while also looking at cuts. So um, I would love to, yeah, before we get um, pulled into the details, 
to talk about principles to guide our decision making. Oh, gotcha. I was in my world, principles. Um, I was thinking. <laughs> That's people. not a bad idea either, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I should have. <laughs> Gotcha. Whenever I say that word, I should specify PLE. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that could be a good agenda item. I mean, we could have a, maybe a little bit of conversation here, and that might be a useful thing to kind of launch in the context of the workshop um, as a discussion point in the workshop next week. And as, well. as a sorry, as a quick follow up question, um, which is related to um, what Board Member Figure was just saying, um, Aaron, I'm interested, I'm curious whether you are looking for ideas from committee members, from board members, from staff, from the broader community, what's the scope of where you're looking to hear ideas from? Um, well, definitely you all starting here. Um, uh, and I mean, I think you know, and that's, I mean, a little bit, I mean, I'm interested in kind of conversation about process. I mean, you know, obviously, we're at the finish line tomorrow for FY24 budget. Um, so, you know, we wanted, right, um, to, you know, ensure we had some anchor point before we close the year to open up this conversation. So, um, I mean, you know, transparently, haven't devoted a deep amount of time to thinking about that, but could imagine the utility. Um, and I think there's, um, and, you know, I think, with the frame of the guiding principles and what kind of guardrails we put on that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know with the number of ideas that we have out there and the substantive nature of what that might mean for how schools are organized in Portland, you know, that engage, you know, collecting ideas can form as engagement and education around the ideas on the table as well. There's a reciprocal element of it that could have some benefit as we launch the school year next year. So, um, so I haven't done deep thinking on that point, but can imagine the role and utility as we, um, you know, um, yeah. Move sort of the, I'm thinking about it sort of as like the other side of the coin of participatory budgeting, you know, not a bucket of money, how do we spend it? But, you know, what, what have you seen that you have questions about, you know, could this be made more efficient? And maybe it can't, but, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, board member Opperman, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with Emily. Um, 100% that we do need to set priorities within our Portland promise of what we can accomplish at different times, um, because I think we can't accomplish all of it. That would be my, my first piece. So I think setting that a, a priority. The second thing is making suggestions or understanding needs, needs understanding um, as to what we've been doing. You know, when we're looking at um, reconfiguration of elementary schools or consolidate I'm involved in looking at the consolidation but you know as I said the athletic co-curricular where is that money being spent how is it being spent how is now so that we that when people make start talking about it we as a board has a be have a better understanding of you know, this, this is, this is, this is the personnel, this is my equipment, this is what's internal, this is what we hire out, you know, it, we hear it, but I don't know it. And I, and I'm feeling in, as along with making priorities, having a better understanding of what we've been doing, and it's close relationship to the Portland Promise because I'm looking over what the, your slideshow has and I'm saying, you know, you're right. Those are old ones, but you know, gee, why should we stop at 5%? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of some people back here on my shoulder saying, why, why not 1%? And you know, what would that cost? And you know, I, that's leave it mm -hmm. at that. I think priorities and I think knowledge about what we have already been spending our money on in detail, because I don't mm -hmm. know that. Mm -hmm. um, sorry to step over your last few words there. Um, I just want to uh, validate that. I think, I think I heard what you were saying is sort of um, following up on board member Figdor's comments about not getting you know, pulled into the details too early. I think I heard you saying that you want to strike the right balance to get enough detail so that we know what we're talking about. Yes. About each of these books. Okay. Yeah. More, more than what it, we see in the uh, the budget book. I mean, that to me, the budget book doesn't say this deals directly with that. 
in, in our priorities. You know, what's really going to the, to the student, to the classroom, um, mm-hmm. because you no, know, that's my place in this whole thing. It's where is it, where's it going to hit that each and every one of those students mm-hmm. and make them successful. So mm-hmm. leave it at that. Two quick connections to that. Like one, you know, I think a frame that we had used, you know, previously um, that may, you know, may continue to be appropriate just as we kind of guide, you know, um, I don't know if we'd call it guiding principles exactly, but just, you know, an examination of kind of quote unquote legacy investments versus equity investments. And so, um, you know, I think Julie, and to your point, right, you know, need to understand them, right, to be able to think about are those worth sustaining or are those opportunities for reallocation or reprioritization. Um, the other thing I just want to acknowledge that, you know, Ryan and I have had initial conversations with, obviously, you know, um, appreciated kind of his framing um, coming in about the kind of, you know, refresh both from his entry plan, right, you know, and understanding, learning, growing, thinking about the rearticulation of the Portland Promise work, right, and kind of 2.0, you know, the kind of aligned, we're working to align the kind of scope of work we have with our partner Attuned about helping to update the metrics and things associated with that. So we're, you know, working on kind of having some collaborative conversations to kind of dovetail all of that. Um, but that's, you know, that'll be a piece in this mix as well, right, to just acknowledge that we're not just making, you know, to the point of guiding principles, right, we're not just making resource decisions, you know, um, that they're in service of an explicit, you know, set of goals and stri- priorities and strategies that we're trying to execute upon. And so we'll be, you know, I think, you know, the timing is in some respects really good, right, to be able to kind of have six months of this engagement, right, and not, you know, not more would be great also but um you know but just to be able to be having both of those conversations at once um you know afford some opportunity or at least can help us drive some of the resource conversation in ways that might get more challenging you know kind of if they were not so kind of temporally connected in time you know board member offerman go ahead thank you um yes and i think in the course of this six months um, even as we, the people who are working in the classroom were saying, what am I going to be able to do in the following year? What should I plan? What materials am I going to have in my classroom? How many kids am I going to have in my classroom in the, their long-term planning that we you know, stay open and, and fresh as much as we can with them and with the community? Because I think it's showing that we are trying to do this um, deep dive into um, the meaning of Portland Promise in a very active way, it'll be really, really important for people to follow along, you know, not just from tomorrow saying, oh, you know, cross our fingers tomorrow um, for what's what will, will happen, but beyond so that they go rah, rah, as opposed to, oh, you've got to be kidding again, you know, that kind of piece. So mm-hmm. I, I just hear a lot of that. So thanks for letting me know. Mo- Erin, um, um, I am curious about how you're feeling about time because we have 20 minutes left. I'm not sure how much of the conversation you have in your mind still. Um, I do have a question and I'm just sort of guessing. I, I want to figure out whether you want me to ask it as quickly as possible or whether you're feeling okay on pace. Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit anxious about time. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask it quickly. <laughs> so I'm curious about um, whether... There might be a way to um, take that. So like the existing list of um, potential strategies. I'm wondering whether there might be a way to get us as a group enough detail so that we all have a solid understanding of what each item actually is and then get a sense of whether there are any items that like just we're not going to support. Like just no, we're not going to do that. So like don't waste time on them it's tricky because you need enough info. You know, I know some of the items might not have enough detail for us to be able to make that um, determination, but I wanted to sort of float that as an idea to be efficient with all of our time and energy so that we're not going, you know, super, super deep dive on like 20 different things. And like, you know, if, Mm -hmm. if they're not viable. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I jump in? And I really do encourage us to not put the, um, horse before the cart, cart before the cart, cart before the horse. I should never try and say these things because I always mess them up. <laughs> but I guess you don't want the cart before the horse. Okay, <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> long day in my world. Um, but I really like uh, establishing um, some guidelines for the conversation before we get into the details, I think is critical. Um, and I would, in, um, I, I think once a proposal is on the table, um, you know, these many of the options would fundamentally reorganize our district in ways that are going to um, make parts of our community very uncomfortable and frankly can can um, can cause some fear and I, I just think that before we get into those options it really like I would prefer to put all of the options aside for now and spend some real time thinking and and working on and getting input from the community on um, the the principles to guide our decision making. Ryan, go ahead. Um, thank you guys. Um, I mean, I think that when I look at the list that Aaron sent and I think about what board member Figdor just said, right? I, I think of the transition is really an opportunity to listen and learn and to understand the needs of the community and where we're at, right? In a way that my hope is that coming out of that, we would have both the current state of here's what we do well, here's what we need to address, as well as the priorities, the principles, the guiding, the, the guardrails for the work to guide it. Um, and so I, I'm very inclined to go with, you know, board member Figdor's sort of recommendation about thinking about like, how do we map out that engagement um, and map out that time frame that still gets us to the budget in a time that's appropriate. The only thing that makes me nervous about that, um, and not that it can't be a, a both, is that some of the things that are in the structural shifts are pieces that would likely take a year of planning, if not more to do. And so I, I say that all just to say that there may be things that as we go through this engagement process, we may just because of timing be taking off of the list of options for school year 24, 25. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can imagine, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, totally agree with kind of the principal's conversation. And I think it's important for the board, you know, for this committee to start having that conversation for the board. Uh, you know, I think we need to start teeing that up and then continue that. That's going to be an iterative conversation as we move through with kind of more deliberate public engagement. So I do see value in starting to get organized around this thinking and, you know, some briefing, you know, of kind of the, like, what is the scope and scale of like what these things are? So not decision-making, but, you know, I think that that, um, you know, it's probably useful for all of us to do just like level setting on what this is, what it would take, right? Um, that kind of thing. So I'm imagining that broadly speaking as like, you know, for for the August finance committee meeting, you know, just kind of like off the cuff, you know, where we'd have a little bit of time to like kind of get level and have a little bit of a briefing thing about, you know, these are some of the initial ideas um, while we're continuing to kind of um, move forward on this. And again, not for a decision-making stand, you know, purpose, but just to kind of start to build understanding about what's out there um, as we, you know, do some of the further analysis there. Yeah, um, I agree. Uh, Chair Lentz, go ahead. Yeah, just wanted to um, offer, it also just seems like once a month meetings is not going to get us where we need to be in the time that we need to be there. So figuring out a different meeting schedule uh, feels important. Yeah. Well, that was part of what we wanted to get to. So I'm I, uh, not necessarily like, A, just to be transparent, like we don't have to spend any time with a slideshow. I think people are familiar with it. Let's just use that as a resource, as framing, right? So I'm not going to go through the deck at all. Um, um, but yeah, the, you know, I mean, I think, you know, just what we engage around just to this conversation around guiding principles, you know, has been what we wanted to accomplish. But I think I'd be curious to have a little conversation here structure wise, just to be able to bring forward some of this, uh, um, you know, to make visible as well to the rest of our colleagues on the board um, and the public. Um, yeah, what that looks like. So I don't know, Emily, 
you know, I know there was like the cost savings work group that was, so this might be the great spot to kind of talk a little bit about how that was organized before. And I think it would be great for us to kind of close today with some initial thinking about, yeah, this is how we might need to be organized. Um, what kind of cadence, right? What kind of timelines we would want to be working towards. So um, I believe it was 2019. It was before it started, so it might have been spring of 2019. Yeah. So there is a work crew created. It was myself and Lori Davis. Um, we were both on the finance committee and um, and Javier. And the three of us met a lot. And I think the role of what we were doing was um, digging in and asking questions and figuring out what data and information the board would need to consider different options. Um, I don't know if Javier felt it was a useful um, a useful exercise. You know, I, I like getting into the weeds, and so I appreciated the opportunity. And I think Lori and I were, were super engaged in figuring out, you know, what um, you know, doing some of the digging. I have all those files. If it's helpful, I can dig those all up very easily. And I don't know if they're at your fingertips, um, but it wouldn't take me a long time to find them. Um, I think the downside of it was it was just, you know, it was just a board focused exercise. So we were, we were digging into the details and we learned a lot. I can tell you what we learned was there are no good options you know, and, and, and it, yeah. And so I'm confident we will learn the same thing, <laughs> but we'll, you know, there's um, of course, there's a, a lot of detail um, to bring forward. So um, I think coming out of that process, we then, um, you know, I think at that point that Javier just made a recommendation. Uh, I can't remember how, you know, and then COVID hit. So that was kind of where we were at, um, but I can I can easily pull up that those materials and and try and um, and share them and and refresh my own memory. Um, but it largely was uh, the purpose of those meetings was largely to to do to to for Lori and I to pose the questions that then Javier and um, the finance. Uh, department team kind of dug into an answer and central office team, I'm sure dug into and provided answers to, and, you know, we had a lot of good data, a lot of good information, mm -hmm. but I, I think it was limited in, in that we didn't have, a, you know, there was no public, uh, there's no opportunity for the public to engage in that process. Yeah. Yeah, that was going to be my question is what was the reporting out structure, you know, back to the finance committee and that kind of thing. Sounds like, ultimately somewhat, you know, yes, but limited. And at that time, you know, you had to show up at central office in the Casco Bay room to participate in the Casco in the finance committee. That's meeting. exactly what we did. <laughs> I remember. Lots of time in the basement of central office, which Ryan has already been introduced to. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I think the things for us to consider are, um, you know, just these tensions of kind of the timelines and urgency, right? I mean, part of that, just again, from a board rules perspective, like a subcommittee of that size did not require formal board appointments and going through the appointments process and so forth. So moves that, you know, again, um, take some time, not trying to assign value to it, but just those are the trade-offs, right? You know, because of the number of board members, um, participating in it and so forth. So those are some of the things, you know, that we'll need to be strategic around to balance kind of the multiple interests and is there um, smaller kind of work group and then more deliberate public engagement strategy, right? You know, um, you know, so it doesn't have to, all of the work doesn't have to live with, you know, um, you know, a multi-stakeholder group, right? You know, kind of at the table at that way. Are there expectations of structures that we're reporting out to and through beyond the board? Um, do you think it would make, sorry, if you were still talking, I apologize. Um, I'm curious about whether um, there might be value in partnering with um, the Public Affairs Committee to do that outreach and engagement and a yes. strategy around that. Yep. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, we've imagined to your point of kind of like this is the other side of the coin of participatory budgeting, like that this is the meaningful engagement of kind of the setting of our SR funds um, is another component of meaningful engagement. Mm-hmm. And so Grace's team and kind of our parent use structures and things like that, you know, we have kind of, you know, recognized that this is going to occupy some portion of that time and to a degree, you know, leveraging Portland Empowered as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we have eight minutes left, Aaron. Um, oh, uh, just one second, um, board member Opperman. I'm, um, Aaron, what do you want to make sure that we get to in the next, like, are there things that, do you need anything from us in the next eight minutes that you want to make sure that we hit in our conversation? I mean, I'd love to stay on this for just a little bit to imagine. So just, you know, of like how we're going to be organized so that I don't think, you know, we can propose timelines and so forth. We can get into some of those implementate implementation details. But I think just understanding from you all as a committee and as a body that ultimately is responsible for these decisions, right? How you um, want to be organized. And we, this, you know, we may not get all the way there. This may need to be part of the conversation for the workshop with the full board so that everybody is kind of like on the same page. I can imagine, you know, there being value in the, some initial guiding principles conversation with that group, the full board next Tuesday, as well as some iteration of this. Particularly if it's going to be a multi-committee. Right. Uh, mission. Okay. Um, board member Opperman, go ahead. Uh, thanks. I, I I agree that there has to be some kind of this this committee should and come up with some basic structure of how to get information from the board and to co- collaborate with the other group. A concern I have with going to the public is I've been I went to the public meeting for the re in vesting, re in, inter, reorganizing, consolidating the high school. Um, and the turnout uh, from the general public was horrific. Um, and there was there was no there were translators, but there was no tra- there was a translator for Somali. No one speaking Somali was there. Translator for French. No one was French there. There was a translator for Spanish and or Portuguese. That group came and then some of the usual individuals. So I, uh, my feeling as we move forward, yes, we need to definitely make sure we engage, but um, I, I really think the board should go through and, and say, this has been the Portland promise. This is what we've been talking about. This, these are, if we wanted to bring it down to essence of ideas, these are the essential things that the board needs to make sure the school does. And from there, work out and see how it works. But I, I think we need to put that together for ourselves before. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, it's I, I'm paralleling what we had that one Saturday that when we were working, um, looking for our wonderful Ryan, um, that we, we really did some deep thinking. And so I think that's what we think we need to do. It's not, it's not a quick list, one, two, three, four thing. So mm-hmm. my view. Jerry Lance, go ahead. Just um, super quickly, um, just because of kind of the ways that we worked with the multilingual team during the superintendent search, um, surveys are a lower time commitment. And um, like right now we're hitting tourism season and a lot of seafood processing, which really hits our multilingual families um, deeply. And so any kind of like time in the evening may be much harder um, to give. So thinking about like what are lower lift both from our side and family side so that they could participate in a meaningful way that is also information that we will use. Agree, thousand percent. So Yeah, well, I think, you know, uh, I mean, based on some of this, we can, I think what might be helpful is us to take some of this input, you know, we can share it, um, you know, I can connect with Ryan, we have a check in scheduled this week, um, you know, to think about a kind of a proposal um, that we can, you know, use as part of the discussion for the um, 
you know, for the workshop next week in terms of kind of an engagement plan. So, you know, I think that would tee us up for the workshop to kind of focus on some discussion around, you know, initial discussion around guiding principles to approach this work. And then, um, you know, having a straw person conversion of, you know, a timeline and engagement structure um, for the, um, you know, for us to use um, to then get feedback on from the full board at the workshop next Tuesday. Yeah, I think that sounds like a good approach. Right. Okay. Um, any other thoughts to that end for us to consider? And obviously, you know, you can follow up with either of us, you know, offline here, but um, uh, yeah, hearing the variety of thoughts and certainly the kind of structures, um, um, you know, or, you know, this has been a helpful discussion. Julie, is your hand up from before? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I last <laughs> need a button. <laughs> it's a quick button. I think we're all set. Yeah. Okay. One quick thing, and I don't have firm firm details, but I got a very encouraging follow up email about the ELL hardship fund for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, um, so this is, you know, there's a lot more to go and some confirmation, um, but, you know, kind of initial projections were potentially, you know, three quarters of a million dollars or so in terms of resources. The DOE has put forward similar to what we'd suggested of having twice a year evaluation, October 1st and April 1st. And so um, based, you know, obviously based on the April 1st um numbers, you know, the I got confirmation we would most definitely apply or, uh, you know, qualify. Um, and yeah, that potentially could translate into the neighborhood of an additional three quarters of a million dollars for next year. So um, huge opportunity because we are already seeing, particularly for our EOL staffing, significant, you know, FTE ads needed, particularly at the comprehensive high schools where those numbers are concentrated. It's a little more distributed amongst the elementaries. Um, there may be some additional ads needed there too. But um, so anyway, there's more to come on that. That's not definitive at this point, but just a little indication on the revenue side is some good news. From what you do know so far, I'm curious um, whether you know at this point whether so if it's there's if there's October 1st and April 1st in terms of the numbers of students, would would there be two infusions of money or would it just be like those numbers get averaged out for the following year? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's fine. That's, it sounds yeah. like it's really days. Yeah. Okay. She said it didn't, wouldn't, you know, the ED 279 process would continue as normal. And I think they would sure. get, you know, those changes would get scooped up. So the ED 279, Ryan, you'll become very familiar with it's the state funding, um, you know, kind of like document, right. You know, and the formula and everything goes into that. So, um, you know, those calculations will be done kind of, those are based on October 1st. So, you know, those would be, as I understand it, as I understood her initial email and sent her a bunch of questions, I was like, oh, oh, great. Okay. You know, um, and, uh, but, you know, it would be, you know, essentially kind of one-time resources in a sense, right? With the, I believe the understanding that those numbers as they persist, then get incorporated in our October one counts that will form our FY25 projections. Because in the ED279, they compare They'll, you know, for FY25, they'll compare October 1st, 2023 to October 1st, 2022. So they will incorporate any of those changes that had happened. So I think it's like a one time allocation from the fund for the coming fiscal years, how I'm understanding it. Okay. Can't wait to hear more as you learn more. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, we'll get more details and can share with you all, and then you'll be in a position to share you know, kind of in our superintendent's report or something on Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from folks before we wrap up? Okay, then I will look for a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Oh, thank you, board member Figdors, uh, seconded by board member Auberman. We are adjourned at 6.01 p.m. Yay.